Well, 1 John chapter 4, just one verse tonight. Just, but don't worry, we won't get out early, just one verse. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Would you read it with me? 1 John 4, 19, help me here. We love him because he first loved us. What a powerful, powerful truth from God's word. He loved us first. He loved me first, and he loved you first before we loved him. We love him because he first loved us. Think back, those of you who are possibly married in a relationship. I know that uh, I saw Ms. Kaylin Cowling here. She's here tonight at the service. She got home a little bit early and came in time for Memorial Day, and she's going to be married in 12 days. 12 days. She said that this morning, but I said, who's counting? Who's counting? Yeah, no doubt Kaylin is, and Blake probably has some rough idea about what it is within uh, a couple months in there. And I uh, think back, to, though, to a relationship maybe you're in, a husband-wife or fiancé or dating. Who liked who first? Now, my wife and I went on a blind date. We didn't like either one of each other first. In fact, in about five minutes of our first date, I told her I didn't want to meet her. She goes, I didn't want to meet you. I'm going back to New Jersey. Perfect foundation for a strong and lasting relationship right there. Kaylin, Kaylin, do you remember? Did you like Blake first? Did he like you first? Do you remember? He liked you first. Okay. No, I like that because he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> I like that. That's tremendous. And of course, why wouldn't he? Probably started years ago. Is that true, Becky? That, they say that's true. Excellent. So, yeah, Rodney has no idea. <laughs> you know, you hear some of these stories sometimes, and, and you'll hear, you know, a lady and a, and a man talk about their marriage. Like, well, I, I liked him for two years. I liked her for two years or three years or some crazy amount of time, you know, 13 seconds, and then it was love at first sight. Well, this verse tells us in our relationship with God, he liked us first. That's significant. It's powerful because we are not likable people. Oh, we like to think we are. We're pretty good stuff. Pretty good looking, pretty handy, pretty helpful to the work of the Lord. But the fact is, without the grace of God in our life, the fact of Jesus Christ touching us, we are nothing. The best we have, the Bible says, are filthy. Filthiness, filthy rags. He loved us first. Or a primary cause. There isn't a creation. When you can go to prove creation, you can use what's called a primary cause or a first cause. You can take it back to something. You know, someone can say, well, you know, there's a energy, there's energy exploded. Well, you can ask the question, well, what came before the energy? Where did the energy come from? If there was an amoeba, where did the amoeba come from? And you have to come back to a source of something, all right, in order to have a first cause. In the love of God, the first cause is God himself. But we know first causes on a practical level as well. We're going to have kindergarten graduation. This is Cowling. Do you ever have arguments in the kindergarten classroom? You do. All right, how about with the kids? With the kids as well, excellent. You have an argument with two young, young people. What happened? Well, he hit me first, right? First cause. And naturally, I had to punch him back. What choice did I have? You called him a what? Well, he called me this first. So naturally, I had to retell it. We understand first causes in a practical sense, do we not? I had to run him off the road. He cut me off. I had to honk at him. I had to honk at her. She was driving too slowly, a, a first cause. We often pass the blame to someone else for our actions and reactions, first causes. We also understand cause and effect. In cause and effect, we know that one thing causes something else. In fact, if you walk into your house tonight and you turn on a light switch, flip the light switch, and your windows open. You're in the coolest house known to man. Don't leave it. Don't sell it. Or what if you leave the service tonight and you, you jump into your car, maybe a truck or SUV, and you, you turn the ignition, turn the key, and instead of hearing a rumble, your wheels fall off. Well, you say, well, that's not going to happen. I turn the key and, and the engine starts. Cause and effect. Well, tonight I want to look at this cause. He loved us first. There's a first cause and then a cause and effect of this. With God's help, look at the wonderful benefit because of God's love for you and for me. Let's ask the Lord's blessings as we look at his word tonight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, your love, which is bountiful, your love, which is unquestioned about us, Lord. Your love, which was so freely given to us, largely in the form of your son, Jesus Christ and all the riches and treasures there. Lord, help us as we look at your word to understand some more truth about your love. 
Lord, may our hearts be encouraged and our souls touched. Lord, may our actions change because of your love for us. May we demonstrate your love and from us flow to others the love that you've showed so graciously showed to us. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I want to give us just two simple points about this verse. We love him because he first loved us. I don't remember when I first memorized this verse. I grew up in a program called Awana. Anybody else grew up in Awana? All right, Awana, there were sparks and cubbies and pals and pioneers. I still remember the little sparks song. Inside of that Awana program, they had a, a, a lot of Bible memory for children. And somewhere in there, this verse was one of the verses that I memorized back then. I don't remember if I was five or six or 15 or 16. A small verse and a familiar verse, but a powerful, if you let it be, life-changing verse. We love Him because He first loved us. The love of God honors God Himself. You see, this verse tells us that God's love is all about God. Now, now don't miss this. This is not just a simple point. It's a profound point. God's love is not about you and me. It's about Him. We're the object of His love, but His love is all about Him. It's all about God. You see, I didn't do anything to start God's love, so I can't do anything to stop God's love. I didn't do anything to start it. Nothing that I did started God's love, so I can't do anything to stop it. We're talking about this. this It's vital to understand this point, and I'm afraid that sometimes, even as good Christians, we miss that point about starting and stopping God's love. A few years back, I began to ask my kids this question, do I love you? Normally, they'd respond yes, unless unless they were... uh, being a little bit sarcastic. I don't know where they get that from. I really don't. I think it's their mother. I, I think, I think it's their mother. Then I'd follow up with this question. Well, Johnny, I don't love you. Why do I love you? We're at Cast River House in the kitchen there, large kitchen there around the island, when I asked Johnny the first time that question. James was with him there. Danielle was a little too young at that point. I remember that Johnny that first time answered the question incorrectly. So I tossed him on the street for a week, and he got it right then. No, of course not. I asked him, Johnny, why do I love you? He said, well, because I'm, I'm good at soccer. Well, seems to have a little bit of talent there, but that's not why I love him. Now, if he goes on to have a large career in soccer, and, you know, the, the highest paid athlete in the world is Cristiano Ronaldo, $150 million a year. If Johnny got $150 million a year because of his soccer, that could possibly, of course not. I said, no, that's not why. He said something else. I don't know if it was because, you know, uh, because, you know, he gave us hugs. I'm like, no, that's not why. I said, Johnny, I love you because you're my son. There's nothing, nothing that he can do to start that or stop that. I loved him before he was born. I remember the day he was born. So does my wife. I don't know if I love him more then or more now. I love him more completely now. But my love is still the same. I asked James, and he said some things. Well, because I'm, I'm, he gave some attributes of himself. And I said, no, that's not why, but because you're my son. Now they know this routine. They get the answer correctly. But I'm afraid that sometimes, sometimes we answer the question about God's love the wrong way. God loves me. Well, my son, my child, why do I love you? Well, God, you love me because I'm in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And that's not why God loves us, though we ought to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Well, I can say that again, though we ought to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But that's not why God loves us. Well, uh, you love me, Lord, because I pass out tracks for you, and you ought to pass out tracks. We're not fast learners here. We ought to pass out tracks. There we go. That's not why God loves us. Well, Lord, you love me because I use my talent for you and I use my musical ability for you and you ought to do that, but that's not why God loves us. God loves us because he decided to. We love him because he first loved us. Sometimes we feel like we can earn more or less favor with God. Let me tell you, let me try to explain a little bit how this kind of sneaks into our, our minds. Something bad will happen to you. Maybe on the way home you get a flat tire. When you get a flat tire or an accident, all of a sudden it seems like our mind begins to think about all the mistakes we have made. Oh, I didn't spend as much time in prayer this morning as I did yesterday. Oh, you know what? I only read three chapters of God's Word this morning, and I, last week I read four chapters. 
I'm like, oh, I knew it. God's mad at me. That's why I got this flat tire. God's mad at me. And when God gets mad, he gives people flat tires. It's in the Bible. The Egyptians, remember, and the chariots took the wheels off. That's what God does. But isn't that how our mind kind of goes sometimes? Well, that's why I'm sick because, boy, I missed Sunday night service and I knew it. God was just waiting for me there. And it's like we imagine that God is sitting up there waiting to flick us in the ear. All right, not enough to kill us, but just to annoy us. All right, this is how our minds kind of go. And so we forget this verse. We love him because he first loved us. And the minute that we stop doing what we think we're supposed to be doing, God's love now stops. God's love stops, and, and now it's just God's irritation and God's anger. And what do we do? Oh, quick. Oh, i got to get right back to church because then God will love me again. Well, he loves you. Apart from all of that, he loves you because he decided to love you. He loves everybody for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. While we shook our fist in the face of a holy God as rebellious sinners, God said, I love you. God does not hate us, all right, as someone once said, all right, God loves us and he loves his children and he loves everyone in the world, though there are different ways once you become a child of God. And so we miss this point sometimes because we think, oh, you know what, I have now slipped off the Christian bandwagon and so God is just there ready to just hurt me and, and do all these things. He obviously doesn't love me anymore. And then we begin to come back and try to get favor with God. Oh, I'm, I'm sick, so I better spend hours in my Bible because then God will love me more. He'll love me more because the more time I spend in God's Word, I get more of God's love. It's not true. It's not true. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let me tell you, the more we follow God, the more blessings we receive. All right, His blessings come. If you spend hours in God's Word, you'll have more blessings in your life. You can't help but have blessings as you immerse yourself in God's word, all right? But his love, his favor does not change. All right, that's why we can grieve him. All right, we can hurt his heart when we disobey because he loves us. You see, when my kids disobey and every, every three minutes or so they disobey, I don't stop loving them. It hurts my heart. I don't enjoy disciplining them, I, I, but I do it because I love them, not because I unlove them. And now when they bring me a Diet Coke, now I love them again. No, I, I love them. So don't confuse God's love with God's blessings. And don't fall into the trap that I can gain more of God's love or less of God's love. You see, we attach so many emotions and our own feelings to perceptions of God's love. For instance, some will, will act like this. I don't feel like God loves me. I don't, I don't feel like it. What does God's love feel like? What does it feel like? Is it warm and fuzzy? Is it distant? Is it close? I don't know. What is, but, but I don't feel like God loves me. I don't feel like God cares about me. I don't feel, I can't feel the closeness of God. You know our feelings can be deceitful. Do you know this? Have you ever been around somebody who had lice? Come on, anybody ever lice? We'll do lice check for camp, and my wife sometimes at school do the lice check. And what happens when you get around somebody with lice? Come on, what happens? Your head itches. Why does your head itch? Well, because you're like, in your mind, it's like, I've got lice, and you, you can see the lice jumping, right, can't you? I mean, they, they can jump like 30 feet. You know they can hide in pews. Did you know that? They sit there for years in pews and jump out while you're sitting there in church. All right. But you're on some with lice, and all of a sudden your head starts to itch. You don't have lice, but you may feel like you do. Sometimes you can see some bugs, ladies. Some creepy, crawly bugs. You can almost feel the bugs crawl on your skin. It's not there. I was sitting in the chair the other night, watching a little bit of TV with the family. All of a sudden I felt something crawling on my arm. First I thought it was one of those crawly sensations, right? Nerve tingling. It wasn't. It was a spider. Don't worry. I'm okay with spiders now. Remember, not before, but now. We've been told that feelings aren't right or wrong, as long as you're real to somebody. That's what the world would have us to believe. You listen to somebody and, and you listen to their feelings because their feelings, um, you can't argue with them because their feelings to them are real. 
But though feelings may feel real, it doesn't necessarily make them to be true. If I feel unloved, then I must be unloved. Aren't false. Doesn't matter how you feel. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Whether you feel loved or not, it doesn't matter. The Bible says God loves you. If I feel worthless, then I must be worthless. False. False. Doesn't matter how you feel. Matters what the Bible says, what God says. If I feel God has deserted me, then he's not around any longer. Not true. If I feel a life is hopeless, then it must be. If I feel out of love, then there's no love left. I didn't do anything to initiate God's love, and I can do certainly do nothing to stop it. See, God doesn't love in levels. He loves the world. He loves his children. You see on the screen, don't confuse God's love with his blessings. Let me ask you a couple, about a couple Bible characters. Did God love Abraham? Well, sure he did. Yet God allowed him to wander around. Did God love David? Well, sure he did. Yet God allowed him to be chased by an angry king. Did God love Joseph? Well, yes, he did, but God allowed him to be sold as a slave and falsely accused and thrown into prison. Did God love Job? Yet God allowed him to suffer great tragedy. Did God love Mary and Joseph? Well, obviously he did, yet he allowed them to have to flee to Egypt. Did God love Paul? Yet he was shipwrecked and beaten and stoned. Abraham was blessed beyond measure, monetarily, spiritually, and with a legacy. David... All other kings in the Old Testament were measured by their devotion to God according to David's devotion to God. In Scripture, it will say, And this king followed God like unto his father David. And it could have been generations later. Measured by David's love to God. Joseph was the second ruler and saved the children of Israel. Job blessed more at the end, the Bible says. Blessed more on the latter than at the, the beginning, at the end of the beginning. Mary and Joseph raised, clothed, and housed the Son of God. Would you flee to a foreign land to keep Jesus Christ in your house? I'd go to a lot of places to do that. Paul, writer of 13 New Testament books, and many souls won to Christ. God's love began with God is as strong as God and will endure as long as God endures. Don't miss the first cause of the love of God. It's primary. See, not only does the love of God honor God, the love of God should stir me in you. It should stir us. Because God loves me, I want to reciprocate my love back to Him. You say, well, great, I'm glad the Lord loves me so I can live like I want to live. Wrong. Wrong. My wife loves me. That doesn't mean I can live like I want to live. Right? She wants me to come home each day. Now, why is that? She wants me to treat her special, treat her right. And I ought to. I ought to as a husband, shouldn't I? Oh, I should. She loves me, and so she cares how I talk to her. Right? She cares if I talk to her, and she cares if I listen to her. My wife loves me, and yet even though she loves me, she enjoys gifts from me. She doesn't mind flowers, but she likes cash better. That's all right, to each their own. My wife loves me. Because of that, I love her. You see, God loves me, and I want to reciprocate my love back to God. Three ways that we can do that. One, we are bound by love. We're bound by love. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, For the love of Christ constraineth us. It guides us, it binds us, it keeps us and helps us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. This love of God. Sometimes people change as Christians how we operate. They say, well, if you're going to be a good Christian, then you have to do these certain things to show you love God and, and make sure that you wear a tie just right and make sure you carry a big, huge Bible. The bigger the Bible, the better. And somehow we mix up on our expression for love, all right, with what God expects. And we confuse these things. You see, I am not in bondage in my marriage. 
though I am in a commitment in my marriage. All right, there are all those jokes about the marriage bondage, right? You've heard them before. I won't take the time to waste to waste the time now. But I am in a commitment in my marriage. A commitment before God on this platform, before Pastor Len and, because, and before Doreen's pastor, before many of you who are there that day. I am in a commitment. And in my relationship with God, I am not in bondage, but I am in a commitment. You see, because of my love for my wife, there's many things I'll do for her. The truth is, if she wants something, I'll do my best to get it, short of a pony. That is still a hard spot in our relationship. It's only because I haven't found the perfect pony yet. That's why, right? That's why I'm, I'm actively looking so you can send me all the pony pictures. Send it to, uh, you know, uh, 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 Iwantapony.com. That's where I, you send, send it right there. But she does many things for me. She knows what snacks I like. She'll come home from Sam's Club. She goes, I bought you this thing right here. She writes me notes. Because of love, I'm, we're bound by love. I'm, I'm bound by the love of Christ, and you ought to be bound by the love of Christ. Why are you here? I hope it's because of the love of Christ in your life. I hope it's not because, oh, well, what will pastor think if I'm not there at church? I don't have enough time to worry about that. I really don't. Now, some have called and said, Pastor, I'm not back yet. I'm at home still. That's fine. I, I hope you're here. I hope you come eventually. All right, but, but listen, I'm trying to be faithful to God's word and, and to preach the word and to, and to witness and to, to lead the church in the right direction. I can't be worried about every single person if you're exactly here or not, all right? Don't come to church for me. Come to church for him. Bound by love of Christ. We're bound. We're bound by his love. Guided by his love. You see, I'm driving home. I don't drive home and think this. Oh, my goodness. My wife's at home. Oh, 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 this is terrible. Every day I have to go home. You see how nice it is outside? I could be so many other things rather than going home. Yeah, that's how we take church sometimes, isn't it? The house of God. See how nice it is Sunday morning? Oh, I could be doing so many other things than going to church. Oh, you see, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to go home to be married, but what kind of marriage would you have if you didn't go home? What kind of Christian will you be if you don't go to church? I'm bound, I'm bound by love. Because of that love, you know there's some things that I do differently around my house because of that love? Some things, some ways that I, that I, naturally, that I, I naturally would be different on. For instance, I like to put my bowl when I'm done with cereal right in the sink. That's natural. Because of love, I fill it with water first. My wife years ago said, would you please put water in the bowl? It's easier to wash after that. That's not natural for me. Bowls can go in the sink, but it's not a hard thing to do, is it now? Is it hard to put water into a bowl? I don't think so. My wife has a nice little shoe thing right by the front door. I mean, I got lots of floors in the house. I can put shoes everywhere in the house. Naturally, I can put them all over the place, yet my wife likes the shoes right here in the closet over here. That may not be natural. That's okay, though. The love for my wife binds me to these things. So there may be some things for Christ that I don't naturally want to do, but because I love Him, I want to do them for Him. Some of you men pick up your clothes, put them in the hamper, not because it's natural. Some of you ladies leave your husband's tools alone, not because it's natural. One time my wife straightened a drawer for me. I couldn't find a tool for a week that way. She was so gracious and she stopped doing it. That was years ago. It's natural. Things are natural. So why do we get up in arms when we have to change what we're naturally like for Jesus Christ? I'm bound by love. Not only am I bound by love, I am bound to full with love. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love. You see, we love Him because He first loved us. So now I get to love Him back, but I also get to reap. I also get to gain love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So when the Spirit comes inside of me, as I walk in the Spirit, then I get more abundant love. I'm stirred up with love. Because of God's love to me, I now have the ability to show it to other people. What if? What if you had the vaccine for COVID-19? What if you had it? 
Well, first of all, you'd be a rich individual, would you not? You'd be a famous individual, would you not? What if you had that vaccine and you said, well, I'm not going to share it with anyone? You would be the most selfish person. Yet sometimes as Christians, we selfishly steal the love of God. Not willing to share it with others through the gospel or to other Christians or with the unsaved. Don't selfishly steal the love of God. Every time I don't love another, I'm stealing from God. It's not mine to keep, but mine to give. It's not mine to keep. I don't have God's love, so I keep it just for me. It's mine to have a benefit to other people. And lastly tonight, I am blessed by love. I'm blessed by love. You see, Ephesians chapter 2 says this, Among whom also we have all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even as we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace ye are saved. You see, I'm humbled that God would love me. I'm unlovely, yet God loved and makes me to be beautiful. I'm unworthy, yet God loved and makes me his child. I'm unlikable, but God loved and makes me to be good. I'm unprofitable, but yet God loved me and makes me worth something. I'm undesirable, yet God loved and makes me something special. I'm unimportant, yet God loved and makes me one of a kind. I'm unsatisfied, yet God loved and makes me content. I am unknown, yet God loved and gives me a brand new name. I am blessed by the love of God in my life. How has your life been changed by the love of God? I have a Christian wife, Christian parents, and an amazing church. Often I'll go to hospital visits, not during this time, but before this time. And I will sometimes have the thought, as I walk past different rooms, how would you be in here without the support of God's people and the Lord? When we uh, had our children in the hospital, many of you came by to see us. Just an outpouring. When Doreen lost her father, many of you sent cards or gave personal, per, uh, uh, personal words of encouragement to us. How would I, I've been blessed by the love of God in my life. How have you been blessed? I have a wonderful church family. I have so many blessings in a beautiful, a beautiful earthly family, a wonderful heavenly home. I'm so blessed. I have a new name. I have a purpose in life. How have you been blessed? But sometimes we just get some consumed in the here and now. Well, it's hot tomorrow. Oh, look at that. Got to go back to church. We're missing the blessing of God's love. Got to put on a tie to go to church. We're missing the blessing of God's love. Have you said thank you to him lately? You tell him you love him? You act differently because of his love in your life? Or you just take it for granted that he'll be there when you pray? He'll show up when you finally show up back to church. Take for granted that what he did, eh, no big deal. In 1860, the Lady Elgin, a large vessel, was rammed by the Augusta and sank in Lake Michigan, right near Evanston, Illinois. There was a ministerial student there by the name of Edward Spencer, who happened to see the wreck and began to swim and rescue passenger after passenger in the frigid waters. In the process, his health was permanently damaged. Some years later at his funeral, it was noted that not one of the people he rescued ever came back to thank him. God's love has done a lot in my life. It's done a lot in your life. It's done a lot in this church's life. We've been blessed by the love of God. How can we not respond to it? How can we not be stirred up by it? Maybe we ought to start living like God loves us. And why do love, we love him? Because he first, primary, he first loved us. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, we're not very lovable people. Lord, there's nothing that we had to attract you to us. But Lord, you chose to love us with an everlasting love. Lord, may we not be discontent with life, the things you allow in our life. Lord, may we seek to honor you with our love and our short life.
I wonder if you're at night with your heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder if you've forgotten the love of Christ in your life. Maybe those thoughts have snuck in. God doesn't love you. Or, oh, we could do this again. Maybe tonight the Lord reminded you about how much he loves you. Why don't you do business with him? If you're here tonight and say, Pastor, while you spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. I'll see it. Acknowledge it. Amen. Amen. I see that. Amen. 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 Who else? I wonder if you're tonight and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven. You may be with us online and you don't know that you have a home in heaven. I'd love to pray for you when I pray for the others. We'd say, Pastor Howell, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? You slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll see it. I won't call any more attention to you than I did to anyone else. My friend, I'm here to tell you that God loves you so much. So our sermon was about tonight. They sent his son Jesus to die for you. And by trusting in him and him alone, he'll save you from your sins and give you a brand new home in heaven forever and ever. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And whether you're here in the auditorium tonight or whether you're at home or somewhere else in a vehicle, no matter where you're at, you can trust Christ tonight. You can ask him to save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my friend, if you've never trusted Christ, I encourage you to trust him tonight. You can pray right where you're at in your seat here or at home. And you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. You can pray that wherever you're at, and if you mean that from your heart, the Bible says that God will save you. If you've never trusted Christ, would you, Christ, would you pray that now? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. And my friend, if you prayed that just now and in here, would you let me know by slipping up a hand? If you prayed that and you're online, in just a moment you'll see a number on your screen, an email address and a website. Would you send me a message? I'd love to give you a free book. We'd love to rejoice with you. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Trust Christ tonight. As we stand to our feet, the altar will be open. If you need to do business with God, you do that tonight. Lord, bless this time of invitation. In Jesus' name.